Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and joining me today is Ashley Lubinsky, who is curator of the Cody Firearms Museum here in gorgeous Cody, Wyoming. Except last night it got a little rough. Yeah, a little bit of wind and rain. Wind and rain, but that's pretty normal. There aren't four feet of snow. Or tornadoes, so yeah. I consider that to be a win. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the Cody Museum has just reopened with a huge new redesigned layout that you guys spent, I don't know, years? Months. Many, many months, many, many years. Uh, I've been with the organization for about eight years, and we've been really seriously doing the renovation since 2015 when I took over. Jeez. Yeah. And just recently, you shut the whole place down for it was like six months to actually. Uh, about nine building. months. So like it was like quite literally a baby. Um, <laughs> yeah, we we closed the museum last August, and many people got really mad at us, but. You gotta do what you gotta do. And then we did a temporary exhibit while that was all going on. And we opened two galleries in May, towards the end of May, and then we opened everything July 6th. Okay. Yeah. Well, it looks gorgeous. If you're in Cody, you should have stopped before. You should definitely stop now. Take a look. So, you shooting M2? Sort of. Uh, sort of. Sort of. There are some cool interactive yeah. displays as well as Guns are more visible, they're kind of better organized, I think. Yes, um, thank you. Well, they're organized historically rather than just by manufacturer. So we've right. got sections by manufacturer for collectors that want to go in and, and look at that. But really, the whole museum is organized by whatever historical topic we're discussing, which I think is really neat. And I don't yeah. know if many museums do that right now. Probably not. No. So anyway, uh, today we are doing a Q&A session. So uh, I always for these things. I solicit questions from the folks on Patreon who support Forgotten Weapons and make this possible. I figured I'm going to be here in Cody. We should talk to you about museum stuff. Museum stuff. A subject you have significant expertise on. So I have two pages of questions here and uh, well, let's dig right into them. Uh, a bunch of people asked a variation of this question. Yeah. Uh, so I don't have one particular person to attribute it to, but it is, how does one become a firearms museum curator? And as a follow-up, how awesome is it to be a firearms <laughs> museum curator? Um, well, it's really, it's not easy. So in the U.S., it's kind of weird. It's like my little soapbox. You can't really go to school for firearms history, kind of like you can go to school for art history. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand in Europe, in certain places, you actually can get more of a focused degree like that. But so my degree is in history. My master's is in history. Um, but the, you, you specify you know, what you study within that kind of area. And so I studied uh, kind of a macro firearms history and really looked at the perception of guns and culture. So I kind of tracked all of gun technology and then watched how it changed, how that you know affected culture and society and how we kind of build up to where we are today. And so that was what I studied in grad school. And while I was doing that, because if you're going to work in a museum, you got to get real hands on. I spent about three years with the Smithsonian's National Firearms Collection. Okay. And so if you get your degree, you can be real sneaky and you can study guns that way. Um, it's good to get a certificate in museum studies so that you have that kind of handling experience. Don't just go for a museum studies degree because uh, it doesn't give you kind of the area of expertise that you'll need. And then internships, jobs, practical shooting, anything gun related, minimal gunsmithing, do it because it really helps because these objects are so technical that if you really only have the academic like snooty kind of interpretation on it, you really don't quite understand how they operate. And so it's kind of a combination of those. How awesome is it? Well, I'm about to go on vacation, so uh, I mean, you probably should have asked me that question afterwards, but uh, it is pretty cool. But I think a lot of people don't quite know what my job is. so. Curator usually means you get to focus on one specific group of objects within a collection, produce scholarship, design exhibitions, which is a part of my job, only I run the whole collection, which is 7,000 guns and 800 years of history. Um, but I also run the museum, so I also have to deal with you know the bureaucracy and the day-to-day, -day, the budgets to keep the museum up and running, which is a little weird for curator. And so a lot of people think my job is like, I'm always hands-on in the collection, and I'm always just, you know, knee deep in guns, but that's what I wanted to do. That's a collections manager. You want to do that, that's a collections manager. Um, so I basically do a little bit of all the different components that go into running the Cody Firearms Museum. Okay. How many firearms museums are there in the U.S.? There can't be that many. Oh, Ben Nicholson, who's a scholar at the Art Institute, he did uh, kind of a comprehensive website list. Gun museums specifically, I don't know, maybe four or five. You got yeah. J.M. Davis, NRA Museums. 
Uh, was that it? Yeah, and Cody. <laughs> Cody, yes. yeah, well, obviously. but And, and then working. there's a lot of really good collections um, that are within museums. And that's a really oh. interesting thing is the fact that you've got, um, you know, most museums have something related to guns. And there are very, very few people trained in both museums and firearms. And so there's really a dearth in that field. Um, and something that people are really needing. Because with guns, you do have a whole host of different things you need to know, uh, including kind of the legal side of it if you're not working for a government museum. Right. But there are great collections everywhere. Some really good private collections I think you and I both know about. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, next question is also came in from a bunch of people in various forms. How do you maintain guns in the collection, especially ones on display? Like, do you have someone who takes guns out of the display and dusts them off? Do you keep them, like, what do you do for boiling them? Do you do, don't? So What's involved in that? Our museum is an American Alliance of Museums accredited museum. And so we have to follow the kind of standards of museum care with everything. Um, and so we're not, uh, technically all of our firearms are functional. They all have their firing pins in them. That's something some museums do and I don't support that. Uh, but because we're preserving them forever, we don't shoot the collection. Um, and that's something that used to be very common in, in museum collections. And while museum, or firearms are really durable objects, if you're trying to preserve them forever, you know, you don't shoot them. Um, however, there are some kind of ways around that. Now that we've got the museum open, we might do some non-permanent collection where you can shoot it for research purposes. But for the most part, you know, the, the guns are not shot in the collection. So as a result, the care is a little bit different than if you were trying to maintain something for use. Uh, we do have a full-scale conservation lab here, which is really nice. And um, they go through and they do, they dust, um, and they kind of keep an eye on the guns. When the guns are on display, they're kept at about uh, 25 foot cam um, and then if there's like velvet or you know paper or anything in the case, it comes way way down. And that's why a lot of people can I swear? Yes. Okay. A lot of people bitch about you know the fact that there are low light levels in museums. Well, there's a reason for that. Right. Um, and there's um, you know kind of guides on you know what keeps everything good. And so we do about 25 foot candles for guns and like papers normally five to ten. And that's why sometimes the, the lighting is really low in some of the cases. And um, for that, that's basically what we do. And if we need to kind of basically clean them. We use ethanol okay. um, for the metal. Um, we actually use a Q-tip. It's very kind of precise. And we use ethanol to clean off the surface and we use microcrystalline wax to kind of, you know, close it all up. And then on the wood, we actually spit on it. And that, I'm sure, just was going to get a bunch of jokes, but um, that is what we do. I mean, the, the acid in, in, in your saliva, and so you can use your saliva to break down a lot of the technical term, the guck on the on the firearm, and then you use microcrystalline wax for as well. Now, if there's rust problems and different things, we take it down to the conservation lab and they work on it, but that's basically what we do. Periodically, we'll use um, gun oil, um, especially if we're like taking it apart using the, like, and working the actions on it. We want to make sure that it's not dried out, but yeah, for the most part, that's about it. If you're not actually shooting them, it's not like they're going to get dirty while sitting on display. So exactly. Like, so. Although when the guns came in, that was the standard of practice is a little WD-40 and like some gun oil. And so we're working right now on kind of identifying some of those guns that need to be cleaned out so that okay. they're not kind of decaying over time. All righty. Uh, next question is from David. It says, other than visiting, uh, other than visiting donations and telling people about museums, what can the average person do to better support our local and national museums? Oh gosh, um, a lot. So I mentioned that there's really a dearth in scholarship in the US and um, there's not really a lot of people studying it. So one way is you could just actually start studying the subject matter and kind of putting pressure on you know the museums to really understand the subject matter. But the other thing that I try to get um, a lot of exposure for that people don't know, and I'm actually working on this right now, um, is the fact that museums that are non-government entities in the U.S. are bound by gun laws. So we have um, issues, we can't take an unregistered NFA, a lot of people think we can, we cannot do it. Uh, we can't take uh, post-86 machine guns because of the Hughes Amendment, and so one thing I would do to support museums is just raising awareness for that. Uh, because no one really knows that that's a thing. And I, I mean, I've been working with it and I've been talking about it and hopefully we'll see some things change. But uh, in the UK, they do have a license where museums, if you're granted the license, you can collect whatever you want. And we're losing a lot of our history because we don't have this amnesty for museums in the US that are non-government. And so for me, if I was gonna pick one thing that you could do, it would be to talk about that. 
and let people know, let your legislators know that that's a real problem, that, and it's a real nonpartisan issue. Um, and that's one of the things, I mean, I've spoken at Aspen Institute, which is a liberal think tank about it, and even they were like, yeah, this is kind of weird, because if you don't like guns, and you don't want to see them on the street, we're better to put them than a museum. And if you love guns and want to preserve the history, you don't want to see it get destroyed and lost because right. people can't collect it. And so that would be the one thing if I could choose to help museums is to raise awareness that museums really need to get some kind of amnesty um, in the country for collecting firearms to preserve our history. Okay. Which is probably sense. not where you thought that question was going, but <laughs> it, it is not. Uh, it's very relevant in my mind right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, Wayne. Oh, this is good. Wayne says, should you wear cotton or nitrile gloves when handling firearms? So Danny, my assistant curator, is over there and he can't hear us. Um, he wears cotton, but I let him wear cotton. Cotton's fine. Um, a lot of people wear cotton. And um, it's, uh, it's to some extent, it's a personal preference, but there are issues with cotton. I wear nitrile, uh, which is why everyone makes fun of me on the internet for like my weird like purple gloves and stuff. Um, and people like make fun of me when I like hold like a Thompson or something. They're like, why are you wearing gloves? But the gloves itself is a really important thing. And um, um, a lot of people, uh, someone got mad at me on recoil because they were like, why are you wearing gloves? You can just wipe it down. That doesn't actually work because um, when you wipe it down, you actually just spread it out. Uh, I actually talked to our conservator about that. Uh, you ended up just spreading it all around. But with the cotton gloves, you can, especially if you're working with something that's got fine inlay, your glove can get caught on something on the firearm or really any ob object, and it can lift that. And then the other thing with cotton as well, cotton can be abrasive. A lot of people don't realize that. I mean, we use it for a lot of our cleaning, but you do have to be careful. It's, it's minimally abrasive, but it can be. But you also can sweat through cotton. So I get a lot of guys that are like, well, I don't like wearing nitrile because my hands get really sweaty. And I'm like, exactly, because you're not sweating through the gloves. And if you're working for a long period of time, you know, you might want to switch to something nitrile so it's not sweating into um, the artifact itself. And that's why I wear nitrile. But, I mean, if you're doing a photo op or you're doing kind of minimal stuff, cotton's fine. But a lot of the museum profession is moving away from it. Okay. You now people are going to ask why I don't wear gloves in Sorry. some cases. Sorry. Yeah. I wear gloves when the institution I'm working with requires them. Which so when you see the videos from museums. museums. Yeah. Pretty yeah. much all accredited museums. Yeah. 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 Um, what was kind of interesting to me, one of the auction houses, and I'll bring this up because yeah, I know people are going to ask about it. The auction houses don't. Yeah. And I've asked them before, like, is there a reason why not? And the difference that they have is they go through a tremendous volume of firearms. Yeah. Because you know, they're, they're cycling through quickly. It, you know, gun comes in, take it to, to one of the guys, figure out what it is, write it up, describe it, put it back on the shelf, get the next one. And what they found is with, and I think it was particularly cotton gloves, they were more likely to drop a firearm. Yes, not, that is another thing with cotton, yeah. Not very often, but considering how little they handle each individual gun and the fact that it's not going in a case where it's gonna be ignored, it's gonna get sold to someone who's probably gonna shoot it. And not wear gloves. And not wear gloves. Yeah. Um, they found it was actually more more likely to cause problems if they wear gloves all the time yeah. due to the occasional slip and drop the gun. Well, and there are certain things in museums where they won't wear gloves at all because of that. You know, so the the risk to the object is is greater. And you know, the other thing about some of that stuff is the fact that if it's private use, I'm not going to you know judge someone for doing what they want with what they own. But um, with the kind of the glove world, if you don't have gloves and you absolutely have to pick something up, um, the, the stock is your best bet. Um, I have seen guns in museum collections that will remain nameless, not ours, um, that have fingerprints on the metal and the people go, it's not that big of a deal and I've watched it. If you don't take care of it, I mean, it really does start to show up over time. But if you if you have to and you're working with you know kind of a museum collection and you normally wear gloves, the stock is better. And you can also do a test to see how acidic your hands are. Mm. People have different like acid levels in their hands. And so there's like a test, and I'm trying to think if it's like on copper, where you put your hands on it and then you wrap it in like aluminum foil and you just leave it. And I think it's copper. I'll double check and I'll let you know. Uh, it's been a long time since I've done it. And then you just kind of check to see mm. how you know sharp your, your fingerprints are on there. And so some people have like hands that can do it better and then others you know, can't. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Keegan says, what direction do you see firearms museums going? Are they as strong as ever? Um, where do you see the whole, the industry as a whole going? Well, I think it's really to each his own and what the mission of the institution is and what their audience is. Um, are firearms museums stronger than ever? I'd like to think so, because we just opened a museum. Uh, we just reopened our museum. 
What I would like to see more from firearms museums, so I've done a lot of research on kind of the evolution of collecting and firearms museums, and typically firearms museums have a lot of connection to art museums, and okay. um, the unifier in that are, is the collecting kind of nature of how a lot of these things got started. And a lot of gun museums are by the collector, for the collector, which is great if you're a collector, um, and if you know what you're looking at, which is how the old Cody Firearms Museum was, and you know, people like us, we can go and go, oh yeah, that makes a connection to here, and I understand the history, but if you have a museum and a large gun collection where you get a large audience that doesn't know about guns especially with kind of the tumultuous nature of today's kind of climate education is such an important role that we can have in teaching people about firearms basics firearm safety kind of historical context and so we really pushed our museum to one be a sphere for the collector as you know we've got over 10,000 artifacts on display in the new museum but it's we also have a huge emphasis on the history component of it and contextualizing it for people so people can see you know how guns have been used because so often in today's culture a lot of people if you're not around guns you think guns are kind of like over here and gun people are over here and it's separate from American society but in reality for 800 years, firearms have been integral to understanding pretty much all of society, yeah. and people just don't see that. And so, if you have a museum that has the like the opportunity to reach an audience that's non-gun, I really think we need to find ways to kind of bring people into the fold of understanding how they're used in our museum because we're non-political. We, you know, it's not my job to tell you what to think. It's my job to give you enough information that you can make informed decisions and hopefully have a productive dialogue that's not just screaming at one another. And so I would like to see that more with firearms museums is pushing that kind of educational component for an audience that may not be traditional. Okay. Yeah. Uh, next up we have Dina. It says, Ashley, do you have an any anecdotes pertaining to being a female curator of a museum? Perhaps some reactions by individuals that weren't expecting you to be the curator. I so I get it. Never. It didn't happen last time we did a video. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think less gender, more age. Um, so I took over the museum, I was 24, 23, which is like way too young. Like, I'm even going to admit that. I mean, I had a master's degree and I am really grateful that the museum gave me a chance. And uh, the number one way that I was successful was because I never pretended to know what I didn't know. And I would just go in and be like, I don't understand what this is. Tell me how this works. Um, but nice. there are, we do get some weird circumstances. The best one I had recently, I was uh, up in the museum. We just opened, we still had only two galleries open, and I was waiting for someone. So I sat down on a bench right by a case in our hallway. And um, this uh, young guy is pushing this really older gentleman in a wheelchair. And he's got like a beanie on and a blanket. I mean, we're talking like really, really elderly. And um, they go up to our case that has Henry Ford serial number one, 1887 in it. And he starts, the, the older gentleman starts talking about the gun and um, was like in identifying what it was and I just you know chimed in and was like oh it's Henry Ford's as well <clears throat> and he gave it to Harvey Firestone and the young guy turned around and he was like oh do you, do you work here and I was like yeah yeah I run the museum and uh, and so they kind of spent a few more seconds and then the older guy goes and like this is exactly how he said it and it was just it made my freaking day he goes he's turned away from me okay and he goes turn me around I want to see the woman. <laughs> and like, I didn't even know what to do. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. And then, <laughs> it was so good. And then at the end of it, I mean, he came up to me. I was still in the galleries and he was like, and the older gentleman was like, this is amazing. You've done an amazing job. Uh, the other one that my uh, curatorial assistant, my assistant curator, really liked, they're both named Dan for simplicity's sake. Um, <laughs> you did that deliberately. Yep, yep, that's yeah. how I hire. So if your name's Dan, you might be able to have a job here. Um, but so the best is, so my uh, curatorial assistant, Dan Brumley, is a retired law enforcement, and he looks like who you would think would be yes. a gun curator. Yes, he does. And, um, and Danny, they're both in the outer office, and I'm kind of hidden back away. Uh, they're my bodyguards. For, uh, and so, like, a lot of times I won't come out of my office, but sometimes people are talking, and I'll, like, kind of poke my head out. And um, one day some guy came in and asked a, a, a question about uh, a superposed re revolver. And, um, you know, it's a random ass question. And I happen to know, I'm not like, I don't always just randomly know the answers to questions, but this day I knew he was talking about a Walsh revolver. And so I was like, I came out and, and, and Dan was like about to like look it up. And I was like, oh, I think you're talking about the Walsh revolver. And he was like, and like the, the, well, they're my, their favorite thing, Dan, the Dan's favorite thing is to watch. Cause like, I'll say something and then they'll start like, they don't, 
And then they're like looking at me, and they're like looking at them, and they're like looking at me. And it takes about a minute, and then they ultimately are having a conversation with me. But uh, there's been some good ones over the years. But that's kind of a that's pretty standard uh, when I start answering a question, and they're usually talking to my two male employees first. Um, but honestly, people are pretty receptive to it once they get to know me. Um, you see me online or on TV and stuff, and you're like, what the hell does she know? But if you actually have a conversation with me about guns, you find out pretty quickly that I do know what I'm fucking talking about. And they do, people are pretty respond, receptive to it, so. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. But it is funny sometimes. I'm glad you don't have a worse experience with it. Yeah, I really don't. My age, like I said, was really one of the, I looked 12, and I was running the museum. <laughs> And that's not great. The renovation, luckily, has aged me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's really been relatively positive. Good. Yeah. Uh, Dave Plays says, how do you feel about the shoot first preserve debate on historical firearms, especially rare pieces? This issue has been raised by some other video channels, like Mark from Anvil Gunsmithing. Uh, should these guns be preserved, or should people shoot them to better understand history? If you're a private owner of a rare firearm, it's the responsible thing to do. Oh, I don't tell people what to do with their lives. <laughs> and I don't know what these channels have talked about, so am I going to start like a real scandal? Um, so it really de it depends on what you want to do. I mean, obviously, if the gun is safe and it's yours, I mean, that's your prerogative. I'm not going to tell you to, to shoot it or to not shoot it. Um, I think it is really important to learn how to shoot if you're going to know about firearms history, um, whether it is a reproduction piece or a historic piece that's capable of doing it. Um, you know, they're so technical. And... You know, I can talk until I'm blue in the face about how a wheel lock works, but until you fire one, you know, it really... You don't really actually understand. It's actually really... Well, it's really anticlimactic when you shoot it, but it's really awesome in slow-mo. Yeah. Yeah, so like... All the, uh, all the muscle loaders. Oh, yeah. Really oh, cool slow love shooting flint locks. They're <laughs> the best. Uh, and I got to shoot a hand cannon like a few months ago. Oh, cool. Yeah. Nice. And a match lock. Uh, so I recommend, like, if you're really trying to understand it, getting the opportunity to shoot something because it really does kind of put in perspective. Now, if I'm being like academic, Ashley, I'll, you know, there's a lot of conversation about, well, you can't really know the circumstance of what people went through to fully, you know, understand it, but it really does help you. Yeah. Um, and it helps you understand it. And so, I mean, our collection, like I said, we don't shoot our collection because we're accredited. And really, if you're trying to preserve something forever, I mean, it does decay over time. Yes. Um, and so you have to be kind of selective in it depending on what you want for it. But there is something in the museum world that we are exploring, which I touched on, but I'll explain exactly what it is. I can accession something into a non-permanent collection. So we have a lot of stuff. And do I really need another Model 70? Maybe. I don't know. Debate it's that. A cool one. Yeah, well, if it's a cool one. But like, do I really need another one that's really not like you know historically significant? But maybe I need it for the shooting collection. And so if you accession as a non-permanent collection item, you can shoot it. And so I would like to see Cody get a functional firearms collection that's not, you know, it's not going to be Theodore Roosevelt's 95, but right. it'll be, you know, uh, A95. Right, and it so can you be know, the exact same pattern of 95. Exactly, so you know kind of what that's about, and I would like to see us move kind of that direction, because I do think it's a very valuable thing with histories of technology, but for personal stuff, do you, man? Like, uh, well, right. you know, this is something that I have to to balance, yeah. um, especially some of, the, some of the auction houses that I go to where I'm able to shoot stuff. Yeah. The... Their machine gun specialist and I have conversations about, you know, this gun would be really cool to shoot, but it's rare. Maybe it's fragile. Like yeah. We, there are no parts for it. So, that, or, you know, here's one that maybe is also rare, but there we know where there are extra parts available. Yeah. If the extractor breaks, yeah. we can get a new one. Well, see, um, and now in the museum world, the kind of difference with that, it's a very interesting thing from the, that's a difference in the collector world, is that, like, we can't just replace the part right. because that doesn't, you know, it's not how the object was accessioned and came into the collection. And so um, you really have to kind of weigh that in our world. I've had a collector, we have a, a, a WAR in the collection, mm -hmm. and it's uh, one of the serial numbers is everything's right except for one thing um, on it. And I know the guy that has our number and he's got, you know, the, and, you know, we can do an easy swap and then we'd have a perfect serialized, you know, gun. but that's not how museum work, museums work because it has to be as it came in. Um, we either need to get that gun too, and then we could do that. But yeah, it's just it's a weird museum world. Yeah, that's an unfortunate hiccup. Yeah. I know there are collector. I know collectors. I have to send a text message really quick because I just noticed that the lights went out around I, us. I did notice that. Yeah. Is that a motion sensor thing? Uh, yes. We are still working out the kinks, and. Uh, <laughs> so well, she's. 
doing that. I'll, I'll point out. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know some some private collectors who just don't shoot any of their collection guns, and I know some who shoot everything they have almost as a like a specific matter of pride. Like I won't buy a gun and not shoot it. And I think maybe the the far extremes, if they're done simply for the sake of you know, matching that rule. Like if you shoot it, you don't really want to shoot it, but well, I shot everything else, so I have to shoot this. Yeah. And maybe that's, the, that's not the greatest plan, but there's nothing wrong with collecting guns and not shooting them. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with collecting guns and shooting them. Um, if you do shoot them, I think it's incumbent upon a collector to take proper care of them, to at least exercise some basic judgment in, um, am I going to feed this thing craptastic surplus ammo that everybody knows is bad? And potentially blow it up because I know of some examples where that's yes. happened. Um, right. Well, hopefully, know. someone will respond to my text message. Our visitors aren't just like hanging out in the dark. <laughs> Sorry, my job is never done. This is true. Yeah, it will be done at lunch when you get to go on vacation. Yeah, I'm Two days. sure they will not pester you with emails. Uh, they're not, they're, they can pester me with emails, and I will look at one, I will look one hour every day. Yeah. Yeah. Can't stop it. All right, uh, David says some car museums will occasionally display a replica, clearly identified as a replica, of an otherwise unobtainable car. Do you think that's appropriate for firearms to let people see something they would otherwise never see? Um, I do, I do. I mean, if you don't have access to the, the real thing, and that goes back to what I was just talking about, about like what we can and can't collect. Um, mm -hmm. There's three conflicts that we can interpret um, because we can't get post-86 machine guns. And so in those respects, until I can figure out a way to pass legislation, having a non-functioning replica at least is better than nothing. Um, and so, yeah, I support that. Okay. Yeah. We were just talking about that at the conference here, some use of 3D printers. And that was yes. something that came up. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, G says, what firearms platform evolutionary process of design change is best documented in the collection here? Hmm. A lot of them. Best documented. Yeah. Probably just the history of Winchester. I mean, I know it's not an evolutionary process, but I mean, we've got snap hances and, and Michelets and, you know, true flat locks and like we've got the general evolution of firearms like completely represented in, in the collection. But in terms of a comprehensive look at the evolution of a company and the things that they made, I mean, the early, early lever actions. Actually, I just walked my way around that. Early lever actions, Ian. Okay. <laughs> um, and we've got the Hunt Volitional, which is, you know, the first uh, and the only, we think, we think we have the only one, which is the great, great one, more great, probably, grandfather of the Winchester. And the, the thing that has that is the um, tubular magazine, which was the second tubular magazine patent taken out in the U.S. He missed it by six months, being the first. And then uh, beyond that, we have several iterations of the Jennings, which took the hunt and also added a couple of other components, and then the Smith Jennings, which Horace Smith worked on. And then we've got uh, Smith & Wesson Volcanic, and we have New Haven Volcanics, and then you know we go into the Winchester, and we've got a pretty comprehensive collection of the, the Henrys uh, before it became Winchester, and a lot of prototypes that led up to the gun that becomes the first real true Winchester, the Winchester from 1966. And so in terms of that early evolution, it's pretty spot on. I mean, nice. we have things that people like have no idea they even tried to make. And a lot of that comes from the fact that well, like one of the core elements of the museum is the Winchester collection. Yes. So. And um, the one thing, though, about that is the fact that um, just because we have the Winchester collection, yes, we have a comprehensive Win Winchester collection, doesn't mean that Winchester didn't give us other things. And so right. most of our encyclopedic nature of our collection came from Winchester, our crossbows, our longbows, our early ignition systems. I mean, those were all the hand cannon is all from the Winchester collection okay. um, because they were collecting historic guns as well as modern. Right. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, Michael says, how much interaction is there between other museums with firearms collections? Uh, for example, the National World War II Museum or the National Firearms Museum. Uh, is there collaboration between the organizations on specific projects or do you guys all kind of keep to yourselves? Um, so the symposium that we created really started to unify that conversation. Um, I've always spoken and met with different museums. So when we were planning the Cody Firearms Museum, I mean, I used to do, when I was at the Smithsonian, the NRA Museum would come, and I've been to the Autry, and I've been to the World War II, and I traveled to see the collections, but also to make connections for loans, Art Institute, the Met. Um, but really, we weren't talking. And um, about 
five or six years ago, we did. Uh, we were all invited to, to do a roundtable at the Aspen Institute on guns and museums, and we realized that was the first time that we'd ever been gathered together. Um, and in, in one place, we all go to conferences, but we're all spread out, you know. And so when we were finished with the roundtable, we were like, man, we got to keep this conversation going, which is what caused us to make the Arsenals of History Symposium series. And so now we are really all talking to each other. And uh, if you are a museum that's not a part of it, you should come because we do. I mean, we've got Colonial Williamsburg, the Met, most of the museums I just mentioned. Uh, we've got the Royal Armories, we've got the Dutch National Military Museum. We have all of these museums now so that we can connect and, you know, kind of create a relationship so that we can have an interconnectivity to our collections. And one of the other conversations are, you know, now how do we connect them online as well? So if someone is doing research, they yeah. know, okay, it's not here, but it could be here. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. They I'm got the lights back on finally. Yes, they did. Yes. I don't know if you can tell that. Sorry, I was like having like a mild panic attack like, the whole time, <laughs> being like, I should go turn this off, but they hooked the, me up. You, you've got Dan's. I got Dan's. Multiple Dan's to take care of. Yes, you. multiple Dan's. <laughs> uh, Tyler says, hey, Ian and Ashley, as a fellow museum professional, I'd like to know what you find the most challenging aspect of curating and managing such a large collection of firearms. Well, I'm glad you asked. I want to write an article about the pitfalls of encyclopedic collections. Um, it's great to have a collection this size. I'm not, you know, denouncing that by any stretch of the imagination. But I can't, when you have one curator, which is me, I know a little bit about a lot. So I can give you the evolutions. There are some things I can talk about, like single action safeties. Like I can bore you to tears talking about the kind of history of passive and active safety as it pertains to the cold single action. But you know, there's things like that that I know about. But really, my job is to know the entire evolution of firearms history. My job is not to get down in the weeds and specialize in one particular thing, uh, I couldn't do my job if, if that were the thing. And so because of that, um, there's a lot of misinformation in our catalog records. Uh, museums sometimes get a really bad rap for that, like we intentionally are being like, you know, uh, not knowing what we're talking about. So we do the best we can, but when you have such a hard, like a big collection, it can be hard to really identify everything, know what's special or rare, which is why we bring people like you in. We brought um, the curator of Colonial Williamsburg in. We're now, you know, actively bringing in specialists from the different areas, people that can specialize, so they can really tell us more about our collection so that we can better interpret it. But that's the real pitfall of it. It's just, there's no way to know everything. And so a lot of people get really mad at us because we don't know something really obscure in our collection, or we at least know a little bit, but we can't get down the weeds with it because, it's not our job to know all of that. And it wouldn't be possible, there's just not enough time. And there's not enough time in the day. Um, one of the presentations we had in the symposium here, just yesterday, <laughs> um, was from another major firearms collection, huge, you know, thousands of guns, and they were looking at, hey, we inherited this really kind of awful catalog, you know, it was originally handwritten, and when they transcribed it on the computer system, like, some got done, some didn't get done, and we have this overall um, goal, if we want to bring the whole catalog, we want to be able to digitize it, bring it up to a minimum standard of completeness and accuracy. And we can do, with our staff, they were saying, we can do X number of records per year, and we have Y number of guns in the collection, and it's a very simple calculation. We'll have brought the whole thing up to minimum standard in, I think it was 89 years. That's <laughs> really sad. And it, that's the pitfall of a huge collection. It I think is. That's it's something true. That's something that private collectors run into also. Yeah, that is true. I mean, You'll get I people who are like, oh, I'm always interested in getting the next thing and adding this other thing to my collection. And then, but you don't, if you do that, you don't have time to truly dig into and appreciate each individual yeah. item. And you'll find something and you'll ask them about it. They're like, oh, I bought that like 15 years ago. And I, I, I don't know. I liked it. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So the more you have, the less time you have to put into any individual exactly. subject. Uh, Joshua says, I've noticed in my own research that many museums forsake their archival document collection, often not making it available to researchers or not even knowing what they have. Ooh, look, an archival document. Actually, it's a print, but that's fine. That's why you can touch it without gloves. You don't have to archive, you don't have to use gloves. <laughs> uh, I have particularly noticed this with military museums, where it, oftentimes, at least uh, for myself, documents are the most illuminating part of the collection. Is this something you've noticed in the museum field? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> that's it, no. Uh, yes, yes, very much so. Um, the old Cody Firearms Museum. So I do want to point out, we have a full-scale research library yeah. that handles all the archival materials, so we very much take care of that archival material. But there have been past curators of the Cody when I took over where I found like archival material in my office because they, if it wasn't a gun, it wasn't an object. 
And so that was forsaken a lot. And I've cleaned out my office and moved everything down. But that was kind of a mindset for a long time where like if it wasn't a gun, it didn't you know matter. It and it's that's so not true. And so I'm grateful that we have a full scale research library. And a lot of times people email me trying to give me papers and I'm like, McCracken, right. McCracken Research Library, because we do have the, you know, a lot of the original design drawings with the original records of Register Marlin, L.C. Smith, and now Ithaca, and, um, you know, that's a huge part of understanding the right. history, and there was, a, for example, there's a book that just came out that Rob Kassib um, and Brad Dunbar did on Winchester Marlin 1895, yes. and we have on loan from Sagamore Hill and Boone and Crockett, uh, one of Theodore Roosevelt's 95s and 405 that he took on African Safari, and they found while they were here uh, the actual archival record that said that it went out with Theodore Roosevelt, oh, cool. and we didn't even know. Like we didn't know. You know, they found it because they were doing the research on it, and so you do sometimes get those really special gems that help round out your provenance. You can't just by getting a gun and you know someone's like my pappy, you know, said that Buffalo Bill gave it to you know his pappy back in the day. I mean that's not helpful, but right. paperwork is what helps really make that object special. So clearly your archival material is available for people to access. Yes, you can schedule meetings and you, they're very accommodating and you can go and do that research. And now we're sitting in the firearms research and conference room in the new Cody Firearms Museum. So if you schedule way in advance, in advance, um, you can come and we can actually uh, take the guns um, off display, you know, out of the vaults and you can do research here on the firearms. You can go over and do archival. Uh, research as well. How common is that sort of, not necessarily gun access, but the document access in other museums? Most museums have an archive nowadays. Well, yeah, but do they let people into it? The ones that I've been around, but I've worked with big museums, and okay. they usually do schedule appointments, but okay. um, smaller museums, it just depends on their staffing abilities. Okay. Big things, staffing abilities. Yeah. Uh, Paul, I've got one that may be a bit of a hardball. A local general history museum here did an inventory check early in the year and noticed that something like 250 items from blades to a fully functional World War II heavy machine gun were missing, an estimated value of about 100,000 euros. How does the inventory system work at Cody? How often are guns in storage checked? If not for functionality, then for actual presence. I feel like you shouldn't say the name of that museum because they He did not tell me good, the name of the museum. Good, because so they I don't even litigation. Know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Although it yeah. sounds like it's in Europe because it was 100,000 euros. Yeah, well, you know. I there's don't, a, there's I don't a lot know. of Europe and a lot of museums. In Europe, a lot of museums so. in Europe, so there we go. So yeah, how do you like? How do you know if someone like yoinked something out of the vault? Well, there have been lots of rumors over the years uh, about people stealing stuff out of the Cody Farms Museum vaults. That like there have been investigations that didn't happen. Um, and what we do now, we actually leading up to the Cody Farms Museum renovation, we did a hands-on full-scale inventory. We would do inventories, but it'd be a lot of kind of like spot checking and when we did that inventory we barcoded everything hmm. so now every um, object in the museum has a barcode and we track it through barcoding systems and if you've seen you've seen up in the museum there are barcodes on all of our labels as well so mm -hmm. that the barcodes never leave the object um, because we don't want to have hang tags because people yell at us when we have hang tags and it's real tacky looking and everybody always asks you know oh, are you selling those guns no um, and so we use a barcoding system, and that way, you know, if it gets moved, you scan it, you know, from where it was to where it's going, and so it's a much easier way of keeping track of where everything is. Okay. Yeah, and because we have all of our, you know, we've got our FFL, we've got our SOT, you know, we've got all of our licensing, we've got to be, you know, like, yeah. just everything has to be super, super to the T, um, you know, regulated, and so we are using that system, and so far, so good on it. I recommend a barcoding system for a lot of museums if you yeah. can do it. For sure. Yeah. Let's you make you uh, t basically associate your item with your catalog very easily too. Yeah, and it allows to the possibility for a public interface with it as well. Right. Yeah. Alrighty. Uh, Alan says, "What legal complications are there for firearms? You just mentioned having an SOT. Are there any exhibits or pieces you'd like to showcase but can't because of legal interference?" Yes. So I talked about this, right. um, but yeah, I mean, we, we are bound by gun laws, and so the big ones right now are is unregistered NFA and Hughes Amendment stuff. And um, we do have a dealer's license, and so I know that there's a way with the manufacturer's license to have someone else produce the machine guns for the, you know, there is a, like, a, a way, but it's not the stuff that was actually historic, right. and that's limiting. And, um, the, and I know um, some people probably comment, well, you can get a law letter, we can't, we have tried. 
uh, the law letter, the wording in the law letter, we've talked to the ATF, um, and our policy with the Firearms Museum is we go by what the law and the, the paperwork actually says, not what someone tells us is okay. Because yeah. that agent may not be there, you know, in two years, uh, they might not be as friendly, and so we go by whatever it actually says. And we have met with the ATF about that, and they, the law letter, because we're not demonstrating for sale, it's doesn't apply to us. It's not technically. Yeah, and so um, you know, there's a lot of stuff about form tens. You know, mm -hmm. form tending something to a museum, which is a for a long time was a weirdly acceptable way, but was never really a fully legal way for museums to have those, and so. Um, those are the big legal limitations. Uh, what we're working on is hopefully to get a waiver for museums in the U.S. Uh, basically asking for the same thing that like a government museum would have, uh, which is the ability to collect those things so that we're not losing our history. Um, but then there's other things that come into play, like not all museums that collect firearms have firearms licenses. And so, you know, I'm kind of curious, I haven't looked too much into it, but like if the universal background check goes into, you know, hmm. existence, will that affect certain museums with gun collections? Like, will they need to kind of process that and so there's a lot of those questions and so when we write something we want to make sure that it you know gets us the things that we haven't been able to get but also exempts us from future things so that there's not a limitation you know a hundred years from now. Uh, Adam says what do you think is the best way for a college student studying history to approach scholarly research on historical firearms in a modern academic world that is generally hostile to firearms in general? They are. You would know. <laughs> um, it's not easy. I mean, I talked about the fact earlier on that you really can't get a degree, per se, in firearms. Um, the other real limiting factor is the fact that when you're doing, quote unquote, well, we talked about this yesterday, the difference between academic and scholarly research. Academic is a very specific type of research. So being an academic historian, you have a PhD. I have a master's degree, people call me a historian. I, I call myself a historian at this point because I published a lot of, you know, uh, of stuff in, in, in journals. But um, academic is what the university system is usually looking for. And it gets really difficult when you're in grad school and you take like your first historiography course, which historiography is to teach you how to write history. And so you, if you're trying to focus in firearms, there's not a lot of books out there right. that are academically respected by university press vetted, peer reviewed, um, and if you're doing that track, you've got to do that. Um, one book that's been completely denounced by everybody is Arming America, um, that won the Bancroft and the Bancroft rescinded, and there's a new book called Gunning of America by Pamela Hogg, and uh, I don't think too highly of that book. And what happens with the academic scholarship, and the reason it gets really difficult, is a lot of times the academic historians that are writing it, they don't have a background in the material culture of firearms, and so they're looking at like a socioeconomic, a political history, um, so when they start talking about the way the guns actually function, they're wrong. Right. And my question is, if you actually knew how that technology operated, would it change your conclusions? And so I think a lot of the really academic stuff tends to be a little misleading. Um, I'm about to review a book, so I'll let you know if it's worthwhile. It's called The, the, uh, the Lives of Guns. And David Yamin, I'm probably butchering his name, uh, Gun Culture 2.0, if you've never talked to him, you really should. He's awesome. Okay. Uh, he's a PhD sociologist. He's in it, so um, I'm intrigued to see what the, it's a series of essays. But that's a real struggle, is you have to play the, the academic game with the academic books, but they're not always that accurate. And then, when you move into the other side of the research, most gun books have been written by collectors, researchers, and I know you now have a publishing company, which helps the situation because that's something that like, I can look and say, I'm confident that that publishing company, because I know your research is successful, but how do you vet that information? Especially you know, people are self-publishing. Is this information good? Is it gun lore or FUD lore, which I just heard and I'm going to yeah. use that forever now. Um, <laughs> and so it's not easy. I'm not trying to deter this person from doing it. You just kind of have to you know, play the game, go through the university system. Uh, the way I got through it was I actually picked a subject matter in guns that people, you know, it appeased the university system and it's actually pretty badass. I studied armed feminism and uh, female African-American civil rights activism. So I looked at firearms counterculture in the 60s and 70s, which oh, is nice. this radical group of people that you don't traditionally associate with firearms who are arming themselves and creating these really uh, good pamphlets on, you know, firearms basics, self-defense, and then they had some really like colorful 
cartoons <laughs> that go with them. But um, I, you know, that was something that they found really interesting in grad school. And so I found that kind of like medium. But if you're looking at it, the one thing I would recommend is finding a, a, an advisor and a mentor that is maybe a military historian or someone that's got a background in firearms um, and then do independent studies. That's how I did it. Um, I did a bunch of independent studies with a, the chair of our department at the time was a military historian. And so I kind of got free reign to study guns through him. Okay. Yeah, I actually. That was done. a really long answer to. No, I think I might have scared anyone <laughs> that wants to study guns away. No, it's good to know what you're getting into. Yeah. I actually had a minor in history. Really? Yeah. And the one in depth, deep grad level class that I took, I ended up doing a paper on um, armed, violent Jewish resistance to the Holocaust. Oh, I don't want to talk about that. Let's <laughs> talk about that. Not like right now, but let's talk about yeah. that because that's really interesting. Yeah. A couple of the um, concentration camps were shut down by violent uprising and never reopened. Oh my God, that's All right, yeah. we're going to talk about that later. All right, moving on. Uh, Daniel says, it seems that what is old is new again. Ruger has nearly single-handedly resurrected the 30 caliber pocket pistol. Even 38 revolvers are coming back. Uh, there seems to be a steady resurgence of Derringer-type two-barrel pistols. What's one firearms concept you would like to come back or think could make a comeback? You know what I would like to see? Cool prototypes that could have been good, that didn't go forward because wars ended or whatever, money, circumstances. I would like to see a, like a resurgence in that stuff that could have had a chance but didn't for whatever historical reason get made today. There's not a lot of stuff out there that got abandoned that could have been good. Most of the yeah. stuff that gets abandoned gets abandoned for pretty good reasons. I think I'm like selfishly just want the burden <laughs> <laughs> to be made. Yeah. We just want burden. We just want the burden. <laughs> Any manufacturer out there, you've got two sales. Yeah. Because she'll buy well, one and I'll buy we'll, one. We need like a semi-auto version. I guess that's the second best option. Yeah. But it would it would not um, it would make the mag you know the dumping of the mag a little bit slower, just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So a semi-auto Burton light Burst. machine rifle, which would then not be called that. Well, eh, call whatever. whatever. Uh, Leonard says, well, the obvious museum versus museum collection versus private collection question. You know, it belongs in a museum. Uh, Did he actually say that? Yeah. Indiana Jones, like, yes. it's been, I, like, I love Indiana Jones, but it's been so long, yeah. and I've seen the meme, and I'm like, oh, remember that? Yeah, oh yeah, it was right at the beginning. I was going to be a doctor at that point, so like I wasn't really <laughs> paying attention how far I've fallen. Uh, uh, perhaps, perhaps less obviously, how do you divide your time? How much is spent on fundraising, acquisitions, dispositions, curating, arranging exhibits, research? Because you kind of do all of it, don't you? Yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. Um, <clears throat> well, I don't, you know, really, like, I, I, obviously, I think that things should come to a museum if the museum is capable of preserving it and interpreting that history. Um, but I certainly support, you know, private collecting because there's, it's a whole uh, other niche that you guys can do different things that we can't do with the private collections. Um, the only thing that I get worried about sometimes is when it goes into the private sector, you know, just losing it at some point, you know? And it's easy to lose provenance in history. Exactly. When something disappears. But I mean, you can lose collection. that in museums sometimes. You can. Historically, but... they're, they've gotten a lot better. Yeah. You know, the modern museum field is way, way more into paperwork and keeping that all straight and getting it going. Um, but I know that there's been, you know, some bad blood with the museum field over the years, but that's what's caused it to become a lot more efficient. Um, and the way that it operates. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously I want to have all of the cool historic guns in my museum, but I mean, if someone's going to get their hands on it, I'm not going to hate on that. Okay. Yeah. Generous of you. Thank you. Uh, let's see, James says, I had the opportunity to visit the Firearms Museum last August. I hope to visit again this oh God. year. When in August? What changes can I look forward to? Did he come when we were closed? There would usually be some, I I, my assumption would be there'd be expletives in that question if they came on here close. He doesn't sound particularly annoyed. Says okay. August. Early August, we had the museum open. Well, Mid-August, we closed it. So um, if you came when it was closed, everything. <laughs> uh, and if you came if you came before we closed, definitely come see it. It's really different. Um, it is. There's yeah. color on the walls. <laughs> uh, we have uh, 10,675 artifacts on display. Um, everything is placed within its historical context. In terms of actually what you can see, the display, the case display space, we've doubled it in size. Uh, we have a lot more visible storage. Uh, the pull-out racks, you can see both sides, which were in the old museum. Yep. Um, you can see those upstairs as well as downstairs. We've got a gun library um, down here. 
one of the things I really like is there's not nearly as much stuff, I think, left in the vaults in the yeah. back. It, you know, there's always stuff that's going to be in there that's like... Well, that's why we might do a deep session here in yeah. the next couple of years. Because a lot of stuff that's left is not... Right, you know, not all that relevant. Yeah, not important. or we have it already on display like 10 right. times over, yeah. So the problem most museums have is we've got space for 100 guns, but we've got 500. So 400 interesting guns sit in the vault. Yeah. What you've done with these pull open racks is you have very dense storage. Yes. And you go into this basically hallway, no visible guns, and it's all pull out racks. Yeah. And there's a tremendous, like everything of interest in the vault can go in there. Yeah. And so it's not, you know, you don't have a big interpretive display on it, but for the people like me, you know, who are like, oh, I want to see every Savage 99 that you guys have. Yeah. Well, guess what? There's racks of Savage 99s. There's some upstairs. Yeah. There are them for everywhere. Um, but you can actually see them. Yeah. So it's this great balance of we've got, we, you, have interpretive <laughs> displays for the general public, and then you've got, but I love this term. I just heard this term. Gunquarium. Yeah. The gunquarium <laughs> downstairs and in you know, areas of. Honestly, there, like, so it's funny, the gunquarium was coined by Ben Nicholson, who I mentioned earlier in this interview, because um, he studied a lot of gun museums, and the gunquarium is just guns in basically a fish tank. And um, what's funny is I think because we've got a lot of pieces that are see-through now, mm -hmm. so you can kind of see through in other galleries, you can see both sides of the gun. I think it looks more like an aquarium, but I don't think it's as derogatory a term as it was when he originally coined it. Yes, because there's context and there's descriptive stuff. Yeah. And the cool thing about our museum, like we're about to do some summative uh, surveys, but since we've been open, like in May and then also a week ago, there are so many more families in here and there's people talking because there's these reader rails that have context and there's these videos and these media interactives and hand-on interactives for firearm simulators. Like people are, have things that they want to do in the museum that's not necessarily like the old museum. All we had was the guns, which I know sounds like I'm you know, discounting the guns, but that made a very isolation, like an isolationist experience where you were coming and staring at the guns, now you've got someone who's interested in the guns staring at the guns and somebody else is pointing something out or pulling out a rack or watching the video and then they're talking about it. Yeah. I think that's cool. And you have resisted the temptation to have a giant room with a little box that has one artifact in it. Yeah. I mean, box. as a millennial, I do sometimes like, I like immersive experiences in museums and I get them, I don't know, I just, the, the, what they can do with technology is fascinating. And so there are museums that I do support that kind of attitude if that's the mission of the institution and what they're trying to go for. It's not what we want to go for. But I mean, I enjoy a good, like, World War II Museum doesn't have a ton of stuff on display, but that museum is pretty, like, in terms of, no, you don't like it? Just said it doesn't really have much stuff on display. And I, that's what you're going for, I, yeah. But in I terms of, like, the overall knowledge. experience and for that type of visitor that they get, I mean, it was sort of the number four museum in the world, uh, right? Uh, you know, that, and I enjoyed the experience, uh, but I do, I mean, we still believe in a museum, people come to see the stuff, they come to see the artifacts. Um, and so we balanced context and interactivity with the fact that we displayed so many more guns than we displayed in the old museum. Yeah. I think it's tremendously rare for a museum to redesign and display more stuff, especially more guns, than before. I so was told very, very distinctly by my board, there will be more guns on display, and I went, there will be more guns on display. So that was my ass if we did not succeed. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, David says, Ashley, if I recall correctly, uh, which he does because you already said this here right now, you spent some time at the Smithsonian. Obviously, there's a cultural difference between D.C. and Cody, Wyoming in the attitude towards firearms. This may come as a shock to you. What? Do you find that this re is reflected in the museum patrons or socially when people find out what you do for a living? I was just in D.C. for a week, mm -hmm. uh, but I was talking to legislators, so I mean, they knew who I was when I went in. Um, so the D.C. thing is really interesting and the culture thing is really um, interesting. You would be surprised because we are in a town of 10,000. We get about 200,000 people through the doors every year. We do get a lot of people that are from the coasts and around the world that don't have experience with kind of Wyoming culture. And so I get that fairly often, and that's why we built the museum the way we did, because we recognize that that was a big audience push. Um, if people don't know me and they just hear I work with guns, every once in a while I get a kind of a hostile reaction. But to be perfectly honest, I don't really get into politics myself. Um, I don't judge people and jump down their throat for their opinion regardless. And I work a lot, I have a really great relationship with the media. 
believe it or not. Um, they've been really good because I recognized early on there's a difference between asking a question of ignorance and asking a question to intentionally try to, you know, getcha. And I've been able to kind of figure those out over the years. And so I've had a really good working relationship with people. And, you know, one of the things that I do is if someone's emotional, I, it's not worth my time um, because I'm not going to, you know, convince anybody. But um, if someone has a question about, like, for okay, so example, I was doing an NPR interview years and years ago, and I was commenting on how we have a blunderbuss that Catherine McGee gave to King Louis XV of France as a, as a sign of peace. And she just said, the, the interviewer, and I'm you know, friends with her now, she said, you know, well, that's a little weird, a gun for peace. And I said, and I just took a second and I thought, well, no, I mean, you have to look at it in the context of the time. And that was a, a pretty common thing. And we didn't, you know, there wasn't the stigma around the firearms back then that, you know, a lot of people have today. And so you're looking at it with presentism and your eyes and your perception of it and judging the historical past on that. And she went, you're right. You know, and so by taking in that very academic approach, a lot of people, I tend to, I have a lot of friends that don't like guns and, you know, we can have really interesting conversations. And one of the things with the symposium and, and the association I just founded um, is that I have people that don't like guns in that association and they are fighting hard in the university system to get firearms history studied because even though we don't draw the same conclusions from it, they think it's absurd. We're not studying it because if you're not studying it, how can we feel like we're, you know, comfortable in our conclusions and the things that we're pushing. And so you can draw different conclusions from history. That's what history is about. A lot of people think it's one opinion and that's it and it's not. But, you know, I tend to have a very academic approach to when I talk to people like that and it's been pretty positive. Absolutely. It's just random people, you know, that you get that, that don't know you at all the context. But I don't normally say what I do. And you don't fit the stereotype. Way. No. no one's going to look at you. I used to make jokes though. Totally I, a gun carrier. Well, when I was a blonde, I used to like, when I'd go into academic forums, I'd be like, listen, I know I look like a Fox News anchor, but just like, bear with me, okay? And uh, I said that to the NRA meeting, and they were like, what's wrong with that? And I was like, oh, wrong audience, sorry. <laughs> All right, one last question. Yeah. This is from Kyle. It says, have you ever had to say no to a donation? All and the time. And if so, why? All the time. Um, it's one of the least. You don't want my grandpappy's Remington 700? It's a pre-64. It's a great one. This is the word. This is also one of the things we talk about encyclopedic collections. that kind of sucks. Like this is like the least favorite part of my job, which is why I make Danny do it now. Uh, <laughs> but no, we honestly, we turn more stuff away than we're probably accept at this point. You know, we've got 7,000 firearms and we're trying to fill holes in the collection. And so when we look at something and, and I took this attitude when I was the assistant curator and I've, you know, hopefully uh, put it, push that on to my staff now is that if I don't think I'm going to display it, now we only take things unrestricted because there, when you put restrictions on things, it's bad for the collection and it makes it very unmanageable on our end. But um, if I don't think it's something that I'm gonna display because I've got 20 others and there's no provenance to something significant, I don't take it because I don't think it's fair to that person to have it sitting in a vault. And so what I used to do back when we had time, and I hope we can start up doing start doing it again, what I used to do is if I knew of a museum in their area that had a gun collection that would love to have something like that. I try to put them in touch with that institution or at least give them the contact to that institution because it's just to me, it doesn't sit right with me to take something just to take it uh, because I don't want to have a difficult conversation because it's not fair if, you know, but it, obviously if they can't, you know, we have a lot of people who like it's their like dying wish to have stuff in here and we do take a state gifts. But if I can't, if I don't think I'm going to reasonably be able to display it, it's not worth that, right. them, and it's not worth our time with the processing. You don't actually get any benefit. You do a bunch of work. Yeah. And then and then they're sad because museum. they want to come see their gun, and it's in the vault. And it's another museum or another private collector that can't have it. Exactly. Yeah. So. All right. Well, that was quite a lot of questions. I know. I'm sorry for the random <laughs> intermission when we have texting. She really is quite busy. So thank you very so much bad. for taking all the time. I think <laughs> we have you. far better audio today than we did the last God, time. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you are in Cody, uh, Cody is of course the gateway to Yellowstone National Park. There is a smorgasbord of beautiful natural stuff oh. up here to do. You can go um, to the rodeo. And there's a rodeo. <laughs> a daily rodeo. Right? Daily rodeo. This is Wyoming. Uh, anyway, if you're here, uh, the Cody Museum is part of the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. There are four other museums in this same complex. And a research library. And a research library. I should, yes. The McCracken Research Library, they do factory letters for... Winchester, Marlin, L.C. Smith, and at some point, Ithaca. Uh, as well as having just a whole pile of other... Design drawings. Yeah, good. Correspondence, some funny correspondence. <laughs> the, the, we yeah. have this, the Sour Grapes letter. Yeah. Yeah. When Browning and Winchester broke up. Right. Yeah. It was, that was a harsh breakup. 
was a, that letter's great. It's anyway, Anyways, sorry. Uh, tremendous amount of stuff here. If you're in Cody, make sure to stop in. Um, the Firearms Museum. Oh, is, is looking at us. Yes, yes, we're getting the, the evil stare from outside the room. So anyway, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you guys very much for watching. Thanks to all the patrons who submitted questions. You guys are the ones who make it possible. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow with some more cool gun stuff. Wait, does that mean I have to like pay to be a Patreon person to watch this? No. Okay, cool. No, but you don't get to submit a question. Oh. Yes, that's, that's the special perk. So, yeah. All right. Bye, guys. Bye.